Okay, I'd like to call to order the October 20th Development Commission meeting. Um, we're uh, beginning the meeting at 7.02 this evening. So due to the virtual format of tonight's meeting, just a couple quick comments about participation. Um, we'll have participants uh, attending by computer and other means. Um, and so for all attendees, if you would speak clear, clearly and pause frequently when you're speaking, uh, state your name each time before you speak. Um, if for commission members, I'll call you by name when um, generally, um, so no need to restate your name, but um, just to make sure that when they're taking minutes, they know who's speaking. Um, mute your microphone when you're not speaking. And if you have technical issues, you can always hop on by a smartphone or, or a tablet. Uh, and if we need to, we can pause to let people uh, jump back on the meeting if there's a technical issue. So tonight's meeting, uh, we will be discussing the proposed rules and procedures for the Development Commission. The request is to adopt these um, for our future meetings. So these, these will be our operating rules and procedures uh, following tonight's meeting um, after we get through the adoption. So uh, Lucy, um, would you first, uh, before we get started here, call roll of the commission? Yes, um, as I call your name, um, please unmute and say here. Uh, Mike Brennan. I'm here. Richard Sanford. Here. Richard Soa. Here. Patty Dillon. Here. Brooke Shore is excused. Kevin Price. Here. Arthur Schulte. Here. Johnny Cada. Here. Mel Morgan. Here. Great. Thanks, Lucy. Um, so uh, before we get to the main topic on the agenda, um, we've got uh, meeting minutes to approve from our October 6th meeting. Are there any corrections to the meeting minutes from October 6th? Hearing none, the minutes are approved by consensus. Thanks. So the agenda item uh, is the adoption of the Commission Rules of Conduct and Procedures so um, tonight, Lucy, the planning manager um, for um, the city will present proposed rules and procedures for the commission. Ms. Sloman, you have the screen. Thank you, let me share. I have a very brief presentation just to um, give an overview. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Excellent. So um, in general, there are four purposes to this update. Uh, the first one is to update, um, is to correct outdated provisions. And one example is that the 2005 rules had a commissioner serving as a secretary, whereas the current rules say that we will provide you with a recording secretary. Um, the second example uh, is not so much an outdated provision, but um, a more current provision, which is uh, the issue of inadvertent quorums. That's something that's come out of case law. And we um, just wanted to make sure that was included. Uh, the second purpose of the update is to have more consistency for the rules and procedures between boards and commissions. Um, this um, was uh, something that's very important to the clerk's office. Um, for example, the order of business uh, that is included in your rules, the proposed rules and procedures is revised and expanded and much more like uh, that for other boards and commissions. Um, another example of consistency is abstentions. That has, was not a part of the previous set of rules, but for any, uh, and it's not something that you all co uh, commonly do. I haven't seen it in a long time, um, but it's important to note that abstentions are a yes vote. Uh, another reason to uh, update the rules is to provide guidance for um, things that are very specific to the development commission. And that um, the example I give here is the use of alternates. Um, there are provisions in the rules and procedures for other boards and commissions on the use of alternates, but because of the quasi-judicial permits 
and hearings that you are predominantly holding, uh, the role of the alternate, what alternates can do when, how they are selected, um, all of that has been expanded um, specifically um, for the Development Commission. And then lastly is uh, to provide um, procedures for public hearings. You are not the only board that holds public hearings. For instance, um, Planning Policy Commission does, um, but they do not hold quasi-judicial um, public hearings. And those are a little trickier, and um, we've seen them become more complicated and in cases, some cases more contentious. And so the purpose of uh, updating the procedures was to really work through a much more detailed set of um, procedures for these that provides a um, framework for the commission to work with and to make things more predictable for the public and applicants. And that's it. You're muted, Mike. Thank you, Lucy. Um, I think the best way maybe to track through this tonight, since the goal is at the end to uh, get to a place where we a vote on adoption of these updated rules and procedures, um, might be to take it section by section. Uh, just so if there are any questions or suggested edits, then we can handle it um, kind of at one section at a time instead of just opening it all up. I, I don't know how much uh, how many edits or, or questions we'll have here, but maybe that's a, an efficient way to track through this. Uh, and then Lucy, if you could capture any, any <clears throat> adjusted edits, we'll try to get consensus on anybody that would want to make an amendment to these rules. Um, so before we start that, um, before we uh, start with the first section here, uh, are there any questions about how, or suggestions even about how best to proceed through tonight's business? My first question is how how committed are we to this being the exact document? I don't know who wrote it. I don't know what kind of flexibility there might be if somebody suggests a change. Um, so that's a great question. This, um, as I mentioned, uh, the clerks wanted consistency, and the city clerk provided us um, with uh, the latest set of rules that are in use by another commission, which is the Planning Policy Commission. Uh, then uh, the city attorney, uh, Minnie Dollywall, myself, and Tisha Geezer, the city clerk, uh, worked on these. Um, so it um, reflects uh, the four of us trying to um, clarify our questions. Uh, the city clerk has, in fact, offered to make herself available um, if there are questions or concerns um, that need that um, level of expertise um, to help us get through this this evening. Any other questions about um, the process and what we're trying to arrive at here? I guess real quick on a follow up on that, Lucy, if, if there are areas, some of these are referring to state statutes and, and there are very specific requirements that are part of normal kind of operating rules and procedures. I think if we start um, wandering into that territory, you might need to let us know um, where there's limited flexibility um, for amendment. Uh, but uh, generally, we want to open it up if people have questions or suggested edits that we can take them by section. Um, would you, uh, I, I've got a document here that I can edit and track changes. Um, do you want me to share my screen or would you prefer to be able to see each other and uh, instead just have me wait and pull this up either if we get into a more detailed discussion or at the end? Um, is there a preference from the commission? I think I'd prefer to, to see people discussing it and See the changes at the end? Yeah, and I, I think it depends on what, how significant or if there are changes recommended. So I'd rather see everybody until that situation might arise. I, I think that's a good suggestion. So we, if necessary, we can put it up on the screen, uh, make any necessary edits, uh, and then get back to in person. It's a little easier for me too to um, 
to chair if I can see people. So if you can just raise your hand or use the chat feature. Um, if you have a question, you can just write question in the chat and a Lucy or I um, will see it, I think, and we can call on you for, from there as well. But I can see everybody. So just a raising your hand will work as well. So let's, um, let's start by uh, just really the first section. Um, did anybody have any questions or suggested edits? Uh, Commissioner Morgan. You're, uh, you're muted. Thank you. Question on location. Did I remember that we might be meeting down at um, Tibbetts and at some point in the future? Uh, there is discussion of using Tibbetts Manor uh, for uh, public meetings, uh, but that hasn't been decided. Uh, I would... Um, I guess I would suggest at this time that we leave this location. We can always amend them, the um, rules if a different location is selected or make them special meetings um, if they're not being held at the time in the place specified in the rules. Okay, and I guess that was one of my questions too. Do we have to, do the rules have to specify the location or can they say Sunset Outway or an alternative location? I don't know. Uh, let me quit the city clerk while uh, I think there was another question on the floor. Thank you. Was there another question I missed? Uh, Commissioner Stanford. Uh, yeah, question regarding procedure. So are we taking this document from part one, stepping through each part, um, is that what we wanted to do there? So, in other words, uh, chair your question, are there any comments on part one? Did that mean part Roman numeral one? Um, I guess, yes. Well, I think what we'll do is we'll need to take the sections when we're talking about there's a, the major articles, but for, for now, yes. So Roman numeral one, we'll go through the Roman numerals and we need to, we need to break down by section underneath. Sorry, so, I jumped ahead too far. Yeah. So yes, Roman numeral one. And so I'm guessing that <laughs> we don't have any issues. Uh, article number two, membership. I'm guessing that's pretty straightforward. And then article number three. And we can come back to Commissioner Morgan's question. Article number three, let's deal with this article. Um, well, I think we can take the whole article. So any questions or comments regarding article number three? I have um, just one um, clarification um, related to the chair in section two, number two. It says open the meeting on time and call the meeting to order. There are instances where we don't have a quorum, so opening it on time may not be possible. Um, so just, uh, I, I know that's a little bit of a uh, black and white application of that language, but um, just to be clear, there are instances where we don't start right on time at the, at the published uh, meeting time. Um. The way I read this is, and, and since I'm doing this in real time, feel free to let me know uh, if it doesn't read this way to you. Uh, it reads to me as if these are the powers that are granted to you, not necessarily um, that that you must do it. it. You know, if it's not on time, then it is wrong. Yeah, I, I think it's really a technicality here. I, I don't have an issue with the language, just clarification there that, for the, okay. that there are instances we don't open enough time. Right. Are there other, thanks, Lucy. Are there other questions for article number or, or edits for article number three? Okay, seeing none. Um, for article number four meetings, any questions? Um, 
So, Ken, Commissioner Morgan. I, thank you. I just have a comment that we only have to meet till 10 p.m. now instead of 11 p.m. in the old <laughs> guidelines. So, I guess we're slacking off. Yeah, and, and I um, similar comment here. Um, I flagged that as well. Adjourn no later than 10 p.m. There are instances where we have gone long and uh, purposefully because we needed to conclude that business. It was time sensitive. So I want to make sure that the language here does not prevent us if we um, necessarily need to go long from past 10 o'clock that we can do that. Uh, my read of the language, I'm not getting a response from the city clerk yet, um, so I apologize. Um, I'm unable to pull her in, so you're getting um, my perspective, um, is that uh, this is more guidance than um, absolute, uh, given every effort will be made um, to run it as efficiently as possible. Um, uh, I don't think this gives um, the commission the ability to both go long, but also to um, frame the length of the meeting and for, uh, uh, you know, if there's some disagreement among commissioners to have a basis for conversation about how late a meeting can appropriately go. I see uh, Director Dollywall has her hand up. Yeah, you know, what we can do is we can add some language there to say unless um, I finish at 10 p.m. unless uh, by consensus it can be extended by the board members. So that that's usually what we can add there. So you take a vote after if you're extending 10 p.m. You're so close to getting a close to a decision. So you want to extend it another half hour or so you can do that by uh, taking a vote. To extend. Okay. The meeting time. Yep. Commissioner Dillon. You're mute. Uh, you're, you're still muted. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, if it would be more consistent with the other commissions to add the language, I would be fine, but I think it's since it starts with every effort will be made, that's that's not promising that it will always happen. Yeah, I, I uh, after listening to the discussion here, I, I think that that opening um, phrase, every effort will be made, probably gives us some latitude that it's not a, a specific deadline that we've got to hit. Um, one more quick, I have one more quick question. The, the role of the chair here is um, regarding scheduling and or canceling and rescheduling. That is generally the staff uh, takes point on that. So is the expectation that we're going to ask the commission chair to play a more active role in making those decisions or are we are going to continue to operate the way we have where um, the need is identified by staff and the scheduling because usually it's project specific depending upon where you are in, in project review. Um, I, I noticed that as well. And in deference to consistency, I um, didn't ask to uh, change that, but I think that what that means is that there will probably be more contact between staff and the chairperson to confirm schedules, um, cancellations and such uh, rather than um, staff, you know, making kind of making all those decisions. Okay. Um, that, that's fine with me. It, just a, a additional um, administrative burden on staff that I just want to make sure we're not doing something that's not adding value here as well. Okay. Any other questions on article four? Um, so should the phrase unless it is extended by consensus of the commission members or are, are, have we um, reached a consensus on adding that the necessity to add that phrase or not? I, I'm comfortable with the language the way it is. I don't know, other commissioners, is there a strong sense about adding that language? Yeah, I, I thought the introductions that says every effort should be made does gives you the latitude you need, so I wouldn't change it. 
I'm, I'm seeing general thumbs up and consensus on that. So we'll leave the language as it is. Thank you. Um, I think I had Commissioner Sanford, you had your hand up. Thank you. Yeah, um, a couple of comments or questions, and this is a very long article, so I'll just confine my um, comments to 4.1 at this point. Uh, in 4.1a, it says any meeting scheduled outside of the commission's regular daytime or location is considered special. So I noticed that there was no uh, accommodation for virtual meetings in this. So really, according to that language, would this be a special meeting because it's not, it's a different location? Um, my uh, impression is no, because of the governor's order. Um, that is the determining factor uh, in our holding the meetings virtually. Uh, but it's a good question um, that I don't know many of you have additional information to add. You know, my thought was that even when the governor's order may expire, that this may be uh, a more common hybrid way of doing business as a lot of other businesses are. So I was wondering if this should accommodate virtual meetings. Um, is it necessary really to specify that a different location uh, constitutes a special meeting? Or really is it a matter of time and date that constitutes a special meeting? I, I don't know. Um, my impression is that it is, um, I think we're required to provide a location so that um, we are not holding it um, in your basement. Um, at 7 p.m. on the first and third Wednesday where no one can find us. Um, it is, uh, she's gonna hop on. Um, so I think that would be, uh, that's my impression is that because of the, um, Governor's order, we're able to do that. I'm sorry, I'm I'm watching for her to join in case she comes in as an attendee and I need to move her up. So I, I would agree with, we're in a unique set of circumstances. There are a lot of legal questions that related to the governor's order. These are going to be standing rules and procedures for the duration. I think if we have to come back and make additional amendments because whatever happens after we get into whatever the new normal is, then that's always a possibility, I, I expect. Okay, uh, related, may, may I continue on uh, 41? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, on 41D, uh, it, it says that if regular meeting falls on a legal holiday, the meeting shall automatically go to the next day that's not the legal holiday. Um, and I don't think we've ever had that situation, have we? And it says, unless uh, the commission sets an alternative day. And typically, I don't think that the commission sets those alternative dates. Is, isn't it always city staff that proposes the, the next, uh, next date? I don't think we've ever played that role. Um. I'm just making some notes. Um, I'm not seeing uh, Tisha yet. Um, I think that there would be the um, rare possibility, um, for instance, um, Veterans Day is one that floats, July 4th is one that floats. It would be most likely that July 4th would uh, impact the commission since you're the first and third, and it would be unlikely that um, November 11th would fall on the first or third uh, Wednesday of the month. Uh, so I think that we would, um, we would probably be proposing to you an alternative day to determine that we were able to get a quorum and um, that uh, the commission was willing to meet on that alternative day. So, um, in that set, 
sense, I think uh, you are setting that uh, effectively because we are consulting with you. So maybe it's the set, the word set. Well, no, it's really to me that there were two issues with that. Essentially, it says that the commission does it and we really don't do it. And secondly, that it simply specifies that the default, unless the that staff for the commission acts, is it's the next day. And typically, city council chambers don't work like that. I, I, you know, I don't think that we could ever specify that we just want it on a Thursday because a Wednesday happened to be a holiday. So both of those things, you know, I think are problematic with this clause. Commissioner Dillon, did you have your hand up? I, yes, I I did. I think that um, that my comment was covered. That it it is calling for it to be the next uh, the next day was the the thing that jumped out there. Um, and maybe if the language could just be changed to an alternate day approved by the commission or something like that. I might suggest that it, it, it's similar to what we're doing above where the chair is the kind of the go-to as far as determination on, on meetings, that it, instead of pulling the whole commission into the decision, it would be the commission chair and it would be at the next available date or something like that. So I, I agree the language is pretty restrictive here. So Other Patricia, comments? Um, to Geezer, um, city clerk has joined us and I no, finally noticed her. <laughs> um, and so uh, Tisha, I don't know if you have um, the rules uh, in front of you that um, were uh, distributed as part of the packet. I do. And we are currently on page two, um, article four meetings, section one. Um, and we have a couple of questions um, under subsection A and D. Okay. I think the one of the questions um, around A is, that we're specifying a location that we're not meeting at. Um, and uh, is this, for instance, this evening, a special meeting because we're not meeting in the council chambers? And do we need to make some provisions for virtual meetings? Yeah, that's a really good um, question. So um, what the position the city's been holding on this is that um, under the governor's proclamation 20-28, um, which prohibits um, meetings that fall under the Open Public Meetings Act from meeting uh, solely in person, it requires um, an audio or virtual component to any meetings at this time. Um, that that's sort of the authority under which we're um, convening our city council and advisory board and commission meetings remotely. And so um, we, at this point, haven't modified the rules and regulations of um, either our governing body, the city council, or our advisory boards. But, um, and while the governor's proclamation remains in place, um, we're, we're comfortable with that. We include uh, information um, on your meeting agendas and in your minutes citing the authority under which we're um, convening these virtual meetings. So um, when and if that proclamation um, is terminated, then uh, that would be, you know, um, a, a separate discussion. Um, but I do um, commend that you are absolutely understanding um, special meetings correctly, that under any other circumstances, when you meet at a different location, that does trigger a special meeting under the Open Public Meetings Act. Great, thank you. Um, Lucy, you want me to jump down to the next question? Do you have that? The next question um, is in both B and D um, that uh, it's who's setting the meetings. Um, because we cancel our meetings so frequently, staff are typically making those determinations based on whether there are agenda items, uh, permits typically that come forward. And um, 
So there were questions about whether we um, are um, setting ourselves up for extra work. Um, Chair Brennan was kind enough to consider um, both, I think, his email inbox and uh, the effort of staff uh, to do that. And so uh, there were some questions about whether we should more accurately reflect that staff are setting those based on um, whether there are agenda items. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's a good observation. And it seems to me that there could be um, language added and I, um, I'd need to refer to your co current rules. I feel that I've come across some similar language in um, other rules and regulations that just says um, if there are no agenda items that require the, you know, commission's um, action or discussion or something like that, that that could be another trigger for canceling a meeting via staff. Well, you know, B does say that in the um, second sentence, if in any given month there is no business which requires commission action, the regular meeting will be canceled. It just doesn't say by staff. Um, and so I suppose that could be a clarification added. I see. I see that there. Um, I think so it, it never hurts to clarify things. I think as if I were to read that, I would um, I it seems to me that staff could reasonably be the the ones to cancel meeting as you are typically the determiner of um, if there's work to come before the commission, but I think that would be a perfectly reasonable clarification to add. Commissioners? I would certainly prefer that. Uh, currently the construction's passive and it doesn't specify who the actor is. So I think it would be helpful to, in all these cases, to specify who has the responsibility for the action. So the suggested language would be that the regular meeting will be canceled um, by staff is it in, in any given month if there is no business. That which part staff of the or, right, staff liaison will cancel, will specify that the meeting is canceled. Is, there, is the rest of the commission comfortable with that edit? Kind of a thumbs up works. Okay, we've got agreement with that change. Thank you. And then the third one um, was in D, uh, there was uh, a concern that the meeting, if there was a, a, a meeting that, a regular meeting that automatically fell on a holiday, it is automatically uh, set the next day and that it is up to the commission to set an alternative day um, when, again, typically staff identifies this, brings this to the attention of the commissioners and determines whether, uh, you know, proposes alternate days um, because as Commissioner um, Sanford identified, the council chambers are not typically sitting open waiting for things to fill them. Sure. So it sounds like the commission's looking for a little more flexibility there. So we yeah. want the default. Yes. And, and this also uses the language, the commission and elsewhere when it's talking about meeting schedules or reschedules, it's referring to the chair instead of the entire commission. So, um, Sir, you know, this is, these are, are your rules and it's, um, thank you for paying such, taking such care in, um, in reviewing them. I think, um, I think certainly some alternative language could be per offered here and I'm, you know, um, it, you know, I think the benefit in, um, you're, you're absolutely right. It's going to be rare that the day following a holiday, um, is open in the council chambers. Um, and often we have to be more creative with our scheduling. Um, so maybe maybe just leaving 
leaving it a little bit flexible. So if um, in the case of a holiday, um, you know, st staff will work with the commissioner, the chair to determine an alternate meeting date, something akin to that. Could be, could be simple as just saying, if it falls on a holiday, the chair will set an alternative date. In consultation perhaps with uh, city uh, staff liaison. Staff liaison. Everybody comfortable with that as an amendment to that section? Did everybody track that? Okay. Do we need to add something that would point to the timeliness of it? I mean, we know that it's not going to be the next day, but um, specifying a rescheduled date as soon as as the commission is available or something along those lines. So the Lucy, did you catch the original edits to that? So right now, what I, well, I'll tell you what I have. You'll tell me whether I captured it or not. Uh, if a regular meeting falls on a legal holiday, the chair will set an alter, alternate date in consultation with the staff liaison. Is that adequate, Commissioner Dillon, or did you want to add additional language about timeliness? I, I'm not uncomfortable with the language. I'm not sure what the, some of the other commissions look like. I'm not sure if the timeliness clause is, is needed there, I guess. Other thoughts on that question from the commission? Um, Commissioner Morgan. Um, I'm, I'm fine with the way it's stated in that we know it's gonna have to be within less than two weeks, right? Because we would run into another scheduled meeting anyway. Um, and it, I think it's gonna be driven largely by availability of a room to meet and time and all that. So I, I don't think we need to add something about timeliness. Is uh, the commission comfortable with, with that amendment, amendment as it stands then? Any objection? Hearing that, okay, so we're making progress here. Um, let's take this article four by sections. So is, are there any questions or amendments, suggested amendments for article four, section two? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Oh, I'm Commissioner Sanford. Right, okay. Um, let's see, in 4.2, it says special meetings of the commission may be called by the chair or by a majority vote of the commission members. So again, similar point, isn't it really community planning and development department that does that or uh, staff, city staff does that, whichever term we wanna use for that. So would you suggest language similar to the, the amendment we made to the previous section, which would be right. by the right. chair in consultation with the staff liaison? Sounds good to me. Other questions or comments or concerns about that amendment? Lucy, did you capture that? Yes. Okay, good comment, thank you. Any other Questions um, regarding Article 4, Section 2? Okay, Section 3, Forum. Commissioner Sanford. Yeah, a question about uh, 4.3b. So it says, whether in person, by phone, or email, commission members shall not discuss commission business with other members. If a quorum of members are present or in a series, which could create a serial meeting, uh, does that apply to legislative meetings as well as quasi-judicial or is that just a quasi-judicial rule? I refer that question to the clerk. I like that. Yeah, 
Yes, that mm -hmm. uh, that applies to to any meeting of the commission, legislative or quasi judicial. So um, that again um, falls back on a requirement under the Open Public Meetings Act that uh, a quorum of the members don't meet without notice and having their meetings open to the public, but also don't cumulatively meet by talking to one or more individual and sharing the perspective of their previous conversation, what we refer to as a serial meeting. Okay, okay. And so uh, where it says, um, or in a series, which could create a serial meeting. So that means a series of emails, like an email thread about a, a topic. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, Lad. Um, section four. Any questions? Commissioner Sanford. Okay, in um, 44F, uh, during review of a multi day quasi judicial hearing, a regular member who's missed the first or previous commission meeting at which a hearing has occurred. Uh, I think the first is superfluous there. Okay. Um, so in other words, we just say has missed a previous meeting. Missed a previous meeting. On a, on a uh, multi day quasi judicial hearing that would make sense right exactly in other words everything else the same except delete the first right yeah any anybody have a, a concern about that amendment i think that's just a, a clarifying edit i think that's good so language correction thank you for that any other any other suggested amendments um, or questions about the language in this section provides a lot of specificity about the role uh, of the alter alternates and how they're engaged. So, okay, seeing on section five, attendance. Mr. Sanford. Yeah, sorry to be doing this, but Lucy knows very well that's how it goes when a document, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, four, five B. Any member anticipating absence should notify support service staff and the designated staff liaison. Um, support service staff, I don't know who that would be. If I'm going to be absent, I just notify the staff liaison. So, so I, I would recommend deleting support service staff unless that's a new requirement. Anybody well, have a concern? So let me just um, provide some a thought here. Um, I don't actually send you the agenda packet, right? Um, the support service staff is the one who is sending you the packets. And um, I think one advantage of um, having that, and I, and I appreciate that that may not be apparent to you that that is who is um, sending you the packets, is that if I was, for instance, on vacation when the packet went out, um, it might be someone, you know, a, an alter, alternative person who the notice should go to. I see. Okay. So then I wonder if we could make support service staff a little more specific by role. Uh, does that, would Gretchen have a specific role, you know, the distribute, the uh, support service staff in charge of distributing meeting packet. Um, really up to you on what would um, serve your purposes best. To me, it would be the uh, support service. Um, I don't know if it would be staff or employee responsible for distributing the meeting packet. It's long. 
support service staff just seemed, you know, too vague to me. I, I, I couldn't really form a picture of who that would be. Could you say commission support staff? So, because that could be people who are assigned to serve the commission, because that could change as well. So it would be the staff liaison and commission support staff. Would that be adequate? I guess I still don't know who it would be. You know, I, I would like to see an actor qualified there. To me, it's more like who would I who would I notify? The person in charge of distributing the packet. You know. Um, Commissioner Dillon. I worry that if we get too specific, it'll be overly prescriptive. And if at for some particular meeting, there might be a different person who we've been working with that um, would be somebody to to notify that um, we're then being overly prescriptive. I guess I'm comfortable with um, with um, Chair Brennan's suggestion. So it would be the people who are assigned to, not by a specific job title, but by that are assigned as the liaison or as commission support. So at least if you called City Hall and you said, I want to talk to the person that's the support staff or the commission, they would be able to track the person down, I think. I think that's probably accurate. It would be in Lucy's department. I believe that's Minnie's department, but yes. Lucy, Minnie, yes. If I may, um, you know, you guys aren't, how, how is it hap actually working today? You send an email to Lucy and if she's out, you'll get an out of office reply and it'll have a message who to respond to because she's not in the office, right? So, so I think it, I mean, the Gretchen's not going to know. She's not keeping track of who's coming to the meeting, what the quorum is. So in practice, in it, the way it works is the staff liaison, if they're going to be away, we find someone to fill the staff liaison role and we communicate with the commission. So, I mean, I, I think I'm comfortable with just leaving it, notify the staff liaison and not overcomplicate it. I would appreciate that because that's really how we work today. That's how we've always worked, basically. So would that um, have us striking support service staff and the designated and just say notify the staff liaison? Yeah. Are the commissioners comfortable with that? Okay, I think we're good with that. Um, any other comments in section five? Section six, committees. about between the screens here, about section seven. Commissioner Sanford. Oh, just a knit on four seven C one. It says when recognized commenters are encouraged and the, the word two is missing there after commenters. Incur rather after encouraged, encouraged to use. That's a uh, Scribner's error, so we'll take care of that one. I had a, I did have a question here. Um, we added um, the com comment shall be limited to five minutes or less. Uh, are we, um, and we haven't really kept been um, really uh, disciplined in, in the amount of time for speakers at hearings or just commenters. Um, are we going to put in place a more structured way to monitor the time for commenters or do we need to add something here that allows for some flexibility at the discretion of the chair? I believe that's present after number four. There's um, a paragraph that says the chair shall have the discretion to make, make exceptions to the time restrictions or an, impose an overall maximum duration. Yeah, okay. Yep, you're right. Okay, that, that resolves that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions on this section? Sorry, which section are we on? Seven? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Okay, go ahead, Commissioner Sanford. Okay, uh, four, seven, 
C4. Any written materials provided the commission shall also be provided to the staff liaison or the recording secretary during the meeting or hearing. So does that really mean that someone has to provide a copy of anything that they bring to the meeting? Um, it, it's saying that it's provided to the commission and then, and then it should also be provided to the staff liaison or the secretary. So I think the intent of that is if you're handing out letters, um, for instance, it's not that if you're just speaking, that's not handing out written materials. But if you're handing out a paper copy to the commissioners, there needs to be one also provided um, as part of the record to the staff liaison or the recording secretary. Right. So would that be an actual copy then, not the original one that's provided to us? or Because this says, I'm not sure what this says. The material shall also be provided to the staff liaison. A copy, I assume. Well, I assume that the materials provided to the commission are actually copies because they're probably providing more than one to um, the members that are present. Okay. Um, so I, I wonder if we could just clarify being, by inserting the words, a, a copy shall also be provided to the staff. I don't know if we need it. Any questions or concerns about that that amendment? So um, it would take probably a little bit more editing. I believe it would need to say then, and I know you are the professional editor and you will fix what I'm about to say. Um, <laughs> when any written materials are provided to the commission, a copy shall also be provided to the staff liaison or recording secretary, or if, Yes. Just so we get the idea of a copy and that people know that they can't just give it to us, that they're going to really have to have a copy for to be recorded as well. And also on that same one, I was wondering, is this language redundant with 411.0? Maybe th there must be a shade of difference between those. I, I don't get what it is, but it seems like that paragraph is copied in 411.0. Um, I, I, no, I'm not sure where that is in the document, 411.0. Oh, maybe I've got it's the wrong one, sorry. Eight. It's on page eight. Um, and uh, I, I actually think that there's a distinction um, in that, um, I'm trying to find where we were. Um, that was under particip public participation is the one that we were just editing um, on page, the top of page five. On um, page 11, item O, letter O, um, would, so apply to applicants and to um, so not just the public. And what um, this is this is a standard item that appears in the rules and procedures of um, uh, other commissions and boards. But this actually has been a problem in the past um, that uh, applicants may not. Uh, provide things to the staff liaison. Okay, just wanted to make sure we were on the, the same literal page. Uh, 411.0 is on page 16 of 19. Is that the one you're looking at? No. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the number in the Word document because that's where I'm editing. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, this is under... Um, mm -hmm additional rules that shall apply to all public hearings before the commission. Yes, that's the one I'm referring to. Photographs, okay. maps, slides, letters, invoices, and so on? Yes. Okay, so th is this different in any way from 47C4? Yes. Okay. So the, the one that we were initially editing is under public participation. 
Um, right. This would apply, the, the second one that you're identifying would also apply to applicants. And, um, and so that is, is, so there's one that's under participation. This, uh, I think, applies a bit more broadly and is important as part of a public hearing to be clear that applicants are required to provide all the materials that they're using in their presentation. Under, I understand that now. Okay, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Moving on to section number eight. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Schulte. I had a question on section eight. Uh, okay, go ahead. What's your question? Uh, sure. Uh, let me jump to the article here. Uh, so section B uh, regarding conflict of in interest. Um, uh, before the, if, uh, let's see, if there's a conflict of interest, um, shall any, the commission shall declare a conflict of interest as soon as reasonable possible, but no later, later than prior to voting on the issue, which they have a conflict. Um, so I guess my question is, if there is an interest of conflict, uh, is that commission member allowed to comment during the partic the uh, applicant oh. presentation? Um, it, it seems like there needs to be a little bit more clarity as to when um, uh, that should be disclosed. It sounds like before the directly before the applicant presentation. Is that correct? So um, I, it, it's an interesting question. Um, a conflict of interest is different than the appearance of fairness doctrine. So if there is an appearance of fairness issue raised, you would not be allowed to participate, not you, but one would not be allowed to participate in the dis even in the discussion. And the um, uh, commissioner would, if determined to have an appearance of fairness issue, um, they would leave before the matter even commenced. Um, conflict of interest. Um, I, I um, looked at this a, a week or two ago, but I don't remember the specifics enough to identify. Um, I don't know whether, Tisha, you can speak to this. Um, uh, if It seems like this would be more likely to show up in a, in a public meeting than a public hearing. I, what I can speak to is, in, in my experience, typically um, typically someone can identify if an item on the agenda may, they may have a conflict with it. And so usually there's work to consult with uh, the city attorney and the staff liaison in advance. And as you suggested, um, make a statement either before that agenda item comes up or right after it does and remove themselves from the entire discussion. And that, that is what I've seen typically occur. I'm, I don't know what the logic is in this language that allows for a little bit of flexibility uh, to possibly participate in the discussion. I agree with you, it's probably not a best practice, but I can't speak to legal ramifications. So the conflict of a conflict of interest is um, discussed in a little bit more detail, and this is the part that I don't remember um, in the uh, active links that are at the end of this document under the code of ethics, and um, there are two ethics guides at the end. Let's see, code of ethics and ethics guidelines. Um, and what I don't remember is. Um, how much they spell out. I, th I think this, my guess is this language was reviewed by the city attorney. And I'm, I'd be a little concerned about amending because the conflict of interest is, uh, um, those are terms of art in legal world. So, uh, and how they're addressed, there's lots of procedural issues around that. So I would be a little concerned about editing this. Uh, but if there are edits, um, Commissioner Schulte, that you would like to suggest, um, absolutely make those requests. Uh, thank you. That was just more of a clarification. So just um, so just I'm clear, if, if a commissioner was involved in a discussion with a with the developer or um, possibly was involved in the project in any given way, would, would that be considered a conflict of interest? Or is that the other scenario the um 
that would come up under appearance of fairness. Appearance of fairness. Okay. And and so that would be addressed prior to the hearing being opened. Um, Got it. Okay. There is. Um, I'm. I did open the code of ethics, and um, uh, Chair Brennan is correct. There are RCWs related to conflict of interest. Um, many of them sound similar to our appearance of fairness. Um, so I, I do think appearance of fairness will cover us during quasi-judicial matters, and um, the conflict of interest will more likely come into play uh, for public hearing, uh, public meetings, or uh, non-quasi-judicial matters. Okay, that's helpful. I understand that there's two two scenarios here, depending on which scenario you fall under. Um, I wasn't sure if the conflict of interest, my next question was whether the applicant has the right to um, uh, deny, um, uh, you know, participation or not. But it sounds like that's a, the, the fairness, the fairness issue then, right? The applicant has a say in whether or not you can participate. Is that, is that correct? I, I see uh, Director Dollywall has her hand raised. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I was trying to think of when um, of an example of a conflict of interest that could come into play for a quasi-judicial and how that would be separate from a f appearance of fairness uh, example. So if you were looking at a project to uh, approve and you want a fence to go around, you know, and fence the whole thing, I mean, that's not what you're going to probably do, but just for a hypothetical uh, example, and you own a fencing business, so you propose an amendment to, you know, someone proposes an amendment to require a fence around an acre property, and then there would be a conflict of interest because you are in that business that you want to disclose it. So it can come into play. It's just a catch all. But like Tisha said, most of these are going to be addressed earlier during the appearance of fairness questions. But this is supposed to be that catch all of um, if you are going down the path of adding new conditions or changing new conditions and you have some conflict, you know, conflict of interest that you would disclose that and have an opportunity to, you know, to not vote. Uh, for that amendment. That, that's helpful. Thank you. That's all I had for that. Right. Under that 8B, the second paragraph, and after the conflict of interest and the, if the member is excused from voting, they shall leave the meeting room, uh, then they'll be considered absent. And I, it seemed like there's a bit of a focus on absence and not having too many. If you, if it seems like, why well, it's not obvious to me why they should be considered absent. There should be some other term there that allows them to be acknowledged for being at the meeting, but uh, not qualified or something. Well, there's a, there, uh, the distinction is actually between an excused absence and an unexcused absence. So in this case, that would um, I, and it's a it's implied. So maybe that's the issue. It says, if a member is excused from voting, uh, they shall leave the room immediately and they will be considered absent. And, and I think the intent is that it's considered an excused absence. So that word could be added before absent um, to clarify. Well, I'm, I'm, I, it just left me a little confused on whether that was an excused absence or not, but apparently it's obvious to everybody else. If, I mean, um, Commissioner Sola, if you want to make an amendment and add that term, will be considered an excused absence, that, that's certainly fine as well. I'd do that. So people, uh, the rest of the commission, are you comfortable with adding that clarification that, that the absence would be considered an, an excused absence? There's agreement with the commission. Okay, great. So can we make that amendment as well, Lucy, for clarification? Okay, um, anything else on, on section eight? Uh, Commissioner Sanford. Uh, just just curious, um, in terms of history, I, I wondered how uh, about um, abstention and how abstention became a vote in favor. My understanding is that there's no state law that specifies how this is treated, and it, it's the, the, uh, up to the, the municipalities. And Issaquah, I know it's the same rule for city council, 
Um, and I was just wondering how that came to be treated as a yes instead of an abstain. It's really an override to Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, so I was kind of interested to see how that came about and why. Commissioner, I um, I wish I had more light to shed on this. I too have been quite curious about where it originated. Um, I am speculating that it is um, it compels one to vote. I think in a small community and um, in the case of our volunteer advisory boards, where there can maybe occasionally be discomfort um, or uncertainty about taking a position and especially, you know, all both our city council and our advisory boards are typically all small boards consisting of less than a dozen members. So to get the maximum input of the individuals who serve on those bodies, I, I think this was just a, a method to compel a vote. That's my theory. And um, as you mentioned, it's not required in state law. It's not recommended by Robert's rules, but it is a provision uh, in this is a Qua city council and all the advisory board rules and regulations at this time. Right. Thanks. And certainly nothing that I've ever seen, you know, occur um, in any of our meetings, certainly. But you could think of odd situations in which, for example, we have a quorum of four and there could be one member voting against and three abstentions and the measure would still be approved. You know, so logically it's, it, it kind of strains, but, but uh, I, I guess there was just kind of a social rationale behind it. To, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Interesting question. And uh, sounds like a logical answer too. Um, section number, anything else on section eight? Section nine uh, and section 10, order of business. Commissioner Sanford. Yeah, um, I just had trouble with sections 10 and 11, understanding the difference between those. Uh, they both concern order of business. Um, 11 is called public hearings, is entitled public hearings, but it seems to be basically just about quasi-judicial and all meeting all of our meetings are public so is 11 a subset of 10 i guess i'll stop there at this point yes um so our order of business for a public meeting which is anything that isn't a public hearing um would be covered by section 10 when we're holding a public hearing Item number four under section 10 public hearing would then be the uh, expanded uh, components of item number four in section 10. Okay, so would 10 then apply to a meeting like tonight to a legislative matter and 11 applies to quasi judicial? I, I just think in terms of trainings we've had when that's been the typical division between meeting types. So 10 would be our order of business for every meeting, whether it's a public meeting or a public hearing. On an, on an evening like tonight, um, there is no public hearing. So number four would be eliminated from the agenda. Uh, where the um, public hearing is taking place, um, A through K would almost be, it would be four public hearings and then A through K would be the components, the order of business under the public hearing if one is being held. Okay, so 11 is kind of a more detailed decomposition of 10 to some degree. Um, and I guess legislative meeting then would be under the auspices of section 10, because it's the type of meeting that we have. Um, would community conference be a quasi-judicial type then? No, there's no decision being made. And um, so it is a public meeting and not a public hearing. In fact, we're only allowed to hold one open record public hearing on um, 
permits that need a quasi-judicial um, hearing. So a community conference, a uh, neighborhood meeting, those are actually just specific types of public meetings. Uh, Director Dollywell. You know, I would add to that's a quirkiness in our code, but those uh, community conferences do fall under the auspices of quasi-judicial matter because ultimately that project is going to come to you for a decision on a quasi-judicial matter. So we have to treat them with the same kind of carefulness about not discussing those topics outside of the meeting, not talking to each other. So they do fall under that umbrella of quasi-judicial. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I, I think I could recall one that we hosted and it was quite formal. I, I couldn't remember whether it was quasi-judicial or not, but I thought that it was. Okay, thank and, you. And, and I, I think uh, Director Dollywell is making an important uh, point to just, I, I don't think that means that it's a public hearing that we are following necessarily all these specific steps, although we may follow many of them. I think the important thing is about your communications outside of uh, the meeting uh, and that that the discussions and such related to the community conference, for instance, become a part of the record that happens during the public hearing on which you're making a decision. And so the same level of attentiveness about who you talk to about what comes into play. Great, any other uh, questions um, on section number nine? I mean, excuse me, 10 or 11? Um, yeah. Commissioner Sanford. Yeah. So, um, 411B, uh, commission members shall attempt to not read or reply to any correspondence received on a quasi-judicial matter. Uh, should we insert, I, I, I understand that the intention there means directly from the public and not from staff, because we always do receive these email and we do read them. So I was wondering if we sh should insert the term received um, directly from the public or unsolicited directly from the public or words to that effect. Any, uh, anybody have concern about adding that language for clarity? No concerns? Uh, Lucy, did you get that amendment? I would say from the applicant or the public because you can communicate with staff, but if someone tries to you know, send you from the applicant side, that also should not be. Okay. Yep. For the applicant or the public. So the way I've uh, proposed it is commission members shall attempt to not read or reply to any correspondence received from the applicant or the public on a quasi judicial matter. Everybody good with that? It seems odd that we're saying we should attempt to. Why don't we just say they shouldn't read stuff from the public or the applicant? Why, why should we? Why should we attempt it? You know, I mean, it, let's be direct. If we're going to be directive, <laughs> it seems like adding that attempt notion is kind of weird to me. Would it be a must not or a should not? It would be a should because you you don't know sometimes when you open something what it is until you start reading it. Right. Then we have an obligation to disclose it if that happens. We haven't had much of a problem here, but it's a formality. So, Commissioner uh, Sanford, as far as the language, do you have specific language that you want to present? Uh, well, I, I think what uh, staff liaison just stated, adding uh, the, the term should not, should not open or, or read. It's guidance, you know. Is the commission is the commission comfortable with that amendment? Everybody seems comfortable. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on uh, this section eleven? 
Uh, Commissioner Morgan. Um, thank you. I question on um, 11B, it's, it's entitled Conflicts of Interest and Appearance of Fairness. And on number four, it mentions conflict of interest. Um, but everything else is the, the um, all the workings of an appearance of fairness and the actual how things work with conflict of interest is covered earlier under number eight. It seems a little confusing to me to have the mention of conflicts of interest here, but the discussion under eight about what you do if there's a conflict of interest. And, and wondering, can that be, since we call this conflict of interest in appearance, can we include what you should do if there's a conflict of interest in this section instead of eight? My hesitation in doing that is that this is specifically related to public hearings and the conflict of interest um, above applies more broadly than just to public hearings. Um, so I think the question might be, should conflict of interest be removed from this section um, rather than trying to fold conflict of interest in here? That would make sense too, yeah. Because the only where I saw it, place I saw it was number four, where it's prohibited, which is already discussed above. So I'd be fine with that if we took it out. So that would be you're recommending the deletion of item number four from that list. And and on the title, it would just say appearance of fairness disclosures. I think the standard questions for appearance of fairness do have the the a question about um, do you have any conflict of interest or material gain? So I'm not sure we can delete it from when we ask you the first four questions during the appearance of fairness, um, you know, questions. But the second time the section eight was sort of a second time around if there wasn't any conflict of interest to begin with, but it, you're right about to deliberate and uh, or on a topic that that's a second time to kind of disclose anything that came during the deliberations part. The way, that's the way I was reading it, but I'm not sure we can delete it from, from here. Do, do we have the standard questions we asked during the appearance? I, I believe we, we, one of the questions deals with conflict of interest there. Lucy, do you have that? I'm, looking, I'm looking for it right <laughs> now. Let me. Um, yeah, so if the, so if conflict of interest, I, I, yeah, that makes sense if it's considered one of the items under appearance of fairness doctrine. And if we need to include that, but then I would say we would take out conflict of interest from the title B, because then it what? would just be about a fairness, appearance of fairness disclosures. Um, I think that the implication of all the questions that we do is a conflict of interest, but I don't think we use exactly that term. So maybe the splitting of the baby is that we take it out of the title of B, but we leave it in uncapitalized form in uh, number four so that it's a more generic uh, sense of the conflict of interest and not a um, specific term. Commissioner Morgan, does that address your that, concern? That sounds reasonable to me. Commissioner Dillon, uh, you have your hand up. Uh, no, I, I was going to suggest something similar that it may be a little bit clunky, but I think there's some nuances in, in both places that it's probably safer to leave it in. Okay. So uh, any objections to amending the title um, by eliminating the conflict of interest statement? No objections? Okay. Any other um, questions or um, edits under Section 11? Commissioner Sanford. On the, that same section, 411B, it says a couple of times that the challenge member would, would be excused from voting on the issue. Is it just voting or is it participating at all? Um, it's, oh, mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. 
Yeah, it occurs in that section twice. It's right at the beginning and then it's down toward the end after commission members have completed. Well, I think the intent and, um, you know, I think the clarity is good. Um, if a member is excused from voting, they shall leave the chamber. Uh, the intent of that is that they're leaving immediately, um, not before um, voting, um, but immediately upon being excused because they're, it, it's important that they are not um, influencing other members or the discussion um, by their presence. I'm wondering if instead of excuse the member from voting, maybe we could do excuse the member from part further participation in the meeting or from participating in the meeting. And is uh, that really well, the intent at a point at which someone declares that essentially they must leave? Is that correct? Right. Um, maybe uh, what if the edit was if a member is excused from voting, um, they shall leave the chamber immediately. That sounds good to me there. And um, again, down at the bottom, I guess that would be something of a rewrite as well. If such a challenge is made by the public, the commission shall then deliberate and vote whether to excuse the, excuse the challenged member from participating in the meeting instead of from voting on the issue. I'm sorry, I don't know where you're reading from. Yeah, it's down at the bottom of that same section. It's the last paragraph that starts after commission members have completed their appearance of fairness. And I was referring to the last sentence of that. Just above C, the opening of public hearing. So then, and then add, um, I was suggesting just change. yeah, I was just suggesting just shall then deliberate and vote whether to excuse the challenged member from participating in the meeting. Um, I would be inclined to leave the language and add the sentence that we were just editing above that if a member is excused, they shall leave the chamber immediately. Okay. Um, that would be another way to do it, sure. Only because the city attorney liked this language, so I, I'm hesitant to change it. We can do it twice, then. That's good. Then Lucy would have to explain herself tomorrow. So. <laughs> Don, I, I think it ought to be an excused absence, too, because they, they went. So don't leave it up in the air. Commissioner Morgan? Um, one other question about the, the, in the section, the... Uh, Part that says a commission member shall consult with the city attorney ahead of the meeting to determine if they should recuse themselves. Um, but then, it, it, say it was the only matter on the docket that night, you would essentially have to show up, um, announce your intent, and then leave the chamber. So would they not be allowed just to say, I'm not going to attend the meeting and make it, I, I want an excused absence. They have to show up and actually disclose that so i've had this conversation with the city attorney recently and um in fact it is an important part of the record and so doing it in that a indir more indirect um manner uh where it would be coming in via staff member rather than as an official part of the record of making that declaration and then being voted, voted to be excused um, is an important part of um, precluding a potential challenge. Thank you. Did, did we capture the edits there, uh, Lucy, to that section? So um, here's the, the edits that I've made in B. First of all, conflict of interest and is being removed from the title. Um, then, um, if a member is excused, strike from voting, they shall leave the chamber immediately. And then in the next sentence, they will be considered, um, I guess I should say, and, and 
in absence when voting occurs. Um, and then uh, in the second to last paragraph um, in B um, about correspondence, commission members should not read or reply to any correspondence received from the applicant or the public on a quasi-judicial matter. And then um, the last paragraph of B would have the sentence, if a member is excused, they shall leave the chamber immediately. And if we are at the point where it would be helpful for me to share my screen temporarily, I would be glad to do so. Are people comfortable with the answer? Or would you like to see them on the screen? No objections. I think I think everybody gave me a thumbs up. Was that a hand up, Commissioner Schulte, or a thumbs up? Uh, there was a both. Okay. <laughs> Thumb, thumbs okay. up and Commissioner, go ahead. And an additional question on that last paragraph right before C, um, where it states um, the chair shall invite members of the public to raise a challenge under the appearance of fairness doctrine. Uh, would the members of public include the applicant at this point, or do we need to state? the applicant and members of the public. I, um, it's an interesting question. I think it's just an open question to the room. Okay. And, and that anyone may respond. But again, if that clarification seems important, um, we can certainly add that. I think we made that clarification up above as well, uh, that we're referring to both the applicant and the public. So I think that would be consistent to add okay. that here as Commissioner Schulte suggests. Uh, uh, other, anybody object to doing that? I'm hearing no objections, so we could make that addition. That would be helpful, thanks. And, and thanks. before we vote on it, um, or before you take any action, I will share my screen so we can scroll through and um, uh, Commissioner Sanford can make the final um, tweaks. <laughs> I have Thank letters you. I'm going to mail you, Lucy. I'm, you know, I'm just sticking to the top level stuff tonight. I know you are. I, I realized <laughs> I made a terrible error um, not having you go through it with your fine tooth comb. Okay, so we're making good progress here. We're getting close. Um, any other, you see, we are still in section nine, right? 11. 11, excuse me, 11. Any other questions? Um, edits, Commissioner Sanford. Uh, just at the top of that section in 4.11 in the list of components of the meetings, I just noticed that that list doesn't have any adjournment at the end, but 10 does. I don't know if, because 11 is a more detailed subset, I don't know if it requires adjournment. I would say no, because um, after the public hearing, there might be uh, regular business reports, uh, other business and announcements. And so I would say then we would go back to uh, Section 10 to address uh, any actions after the public hearing. Right. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense to me, too. Okay. Anything else on that Section 11? I have a question on inadvertent uh, reading of uh, of uh, communications from the public, or, or um, you know, if you, if they send an email and they have return receipt, they see that you've opened the document. Um, do you need to then just say, "I read a, a an email from the applicant, did deleted it," or I guess I'm just trying to it, because it's saying you're, you need to announce that you've read the read the correspondence or inadvertently read the correspondence. Right. So um, I would recommend um, if that inadvertent uh, reading or um, access to the correspondence occurs that you would let the staff liaison know. And then um, so that they can counsel you. Um, and then during the appearance of fairness, um, you would disclose uh, that uh, that had taken place. And then the um, applicant and the public would have the opportunity um, to, you know, question whether that was significant or not. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, any other 
I'm sure Sanford. Okay, last one on 11. Um, if the public hearing is to be continued, that's in 411H, um, if these requirements are not met and so on. I was wondering if this is redundant with 411L or if this is like what I thought was redundant before and there's really a shade of difference in, in the two of these. So 411H and 411L. So I think that um, I think so. I, you're bringing up a great point. I think that the um, that H is intended to address uh, the process used if the commission does not have a consensus about closing the hearing, whereas. Um, L is about continuing the hearing if um, there is, uh, you know, you're not able to accommodate everything uh, during that one evening. Um, but I, I appreciate that that's not, that's pretty subtle. Yeah, so the, there is a nuance there. So I, I wonder if uh, the general statement could cover it by adding a word or two, the 411L. Um, so um, I, I do think H is important in that location because it this is a series of steps that you're going through in the hearing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Right. So I, I, um, I'm not sure that the second paragraph under H, um, Tisha, is necessary um, because I think L does cover the procedural uh, issues. Um, and I think that's really the distinction is H is trying to say, do all the commissioners agree that the public hearing, that the hearing is being closed? Because when that's closed, there are certain things that can no longer take place. And so if there is an objection, this is how you handle it. Whereas um, uh, L is more around notice. Well, however, I do see that H is specific to quasi-judicials and L is all hearings, is that right? Well, this yeah, is all so. under public hearing. Right. The way I'm reading it is H is, if, if you get in the discussion and a commissioner doesn't feel like there's been an adequate discussion or it hasn't, hasn't been everybody heard out, that uh, they will, they will uh, take a vote uh, to continue the hearing. L is really if you haven't fulfilled all the agenda items. So I think, I think there is a nuance of difference. One is we don't think we've heard enough. The other is there's still agenda items that we haven't, we haven't redeemed yet. Commissioner Dillon? I'm actually thinking that the language in L could be substituted for the the first two sentences of the second paragraph in H, um, so that it would provide um, the another situation where it could be continued, um, but then still round out the the last sentence in in H. I think is important to be there that the commission may not proceed to deliberate and vote until the public hearing is closed. But there are a couple sentences in L that are that are the same, and it adds a little bit of information about continuance. Commissioner Sanford. I'm noticing another issue there that I didn't see before up in, uh, where are we, in H. 
the par the paragraph regarding the continuing the meeting. Uh, a majority vote will be required to continue the hearing once the public hearing is closed on a quasi-judicial matter, no additional testimony may be taken and so on. But then the next paragraph still refers to a public hearing being continued. So I wonder if we have a place, uh, um, if the wording regarding once the public hearing is closed on a quasi-judicial matter should really be last, should really be the final paragraph, because the two paragraphs above are really dealing with continuation. And whether that final paragraph regarding what happens when it's closed um, is this language or the other, I'm not sure. But I, I think the last sentence in the first paragraph of H may be out of order and should be moved to the end of that section. Uh, so that's um, the commission may not proceed to deliberate. Um, I think that that sentence does make sense moving up to the end of the first paragraph under H and potentially the first sentence in the second paragraph of H be deleted and rely on L instead. Is that- I would agree with that. that. And, and then my remaining point would be that once the public hearing is closed on a quasi-judicial matter should be last in that section. I'm sorry, say that again. Yeah, that uh, the sentence, once the public hearing is closed on a quasi-judicial matter, no additional testimony may be taken and the commission will be limited to questions to staff only deliberations and voting. I'm proposing that that be last in section H since it regards closing and the other two paragraphs regard continuation. I would agree that that makes sense too, to move that to the bottom. It's, the wording's fine, it's just, it's a sequence question really, it's what Commissioner Correct. is raising. Correct, in other words, I'm just uh, suggesting moving the language regarding closing to the end of that se section. Commissioner Morgan. Thank you, I, I actually have a question about the, the wording of that sentence itself and from a practical standpoint, because there've been a lot of situations where we've closed a public hearing, we're discussing something, and then a question comes up that we want answered by the applicant, or in some cases, a member of the public. But it sounds as if the way this is written, we cannot send any questions to anybody other than the staff. And so is there some way in here it can be written such that we can do that if we want to? Um, no. Um, but I... If you, um, it's your deliberations that need to take place after the public hearing is closed. And by commission practice, you tend to have a question phase and a deliberation uh, and, and a comment and sort of discussion phase. And I think that is the right practice, um, but that we need to close the hearing between those two phases. Um, so that you have the opportunity to ask your questions, potentially direct them to an applicant or to a member of the public, if you so choose. Um, but that once you're past questions, then the hearing is closed and you're commenting and deliberating. So, I, yeah, I, I guess I'm still sort of, because it seems like once the public is done, the applicant has spoken, the public has spoken, and then the chair says, okay, we're going to close the public hearing. And then we move into our discussions, deliberations, things like that. If we're going through those things, and then something comes up where we have a question that the applicant would be best able to answer, technically we can't get an answer from them then in our deliberations. Which, which, which seems frustrating that we wouldn't be able to do that. That may be a question for the city attorney to respond to, I'm not sure. That has been our practice on occasion we do 
ask for clarification of a piece of information that we're looking at from the applicant, for example. I, Commissioner Morgan's right on that. And it helps with our deliberation. And I, I do know there are the, there's formalities to public hearings that we've got to follow. I mean, it's under state law, we've got to do that. So what are what latitude we have, we may have to ask that uh, offline. Well, and, and I think, um, so I'm not sure that there's latitude to change this language, um, but there is, you know, um, it has also been our practice to hold a public hearing over multiple nights. And part of the reason we do that is to allow staff and the applicant to respond in the briefing response memo to the issues that have been brought up um, by the commissioners and the public to further document the record and to ensure that if there's editing or revising of conditions that that can take place. Uh, and all of that needs to occur before um, we get to deliberations. So I think the question is whether there is a way to structure this to um, give the commission access to the um, opportunities that they you want to make sure you're making a decision on with a, a full understanding and uh, not, uh, not violating the tenets of the public hearing. And, and I think part of it could also be then too, if we, if we, know well ahead of time, if we truly understand it, that once we say the public hearings close, we just can't, can't do that. Can't ask those right. questions about and, and I think that was the intent of making this very clear in here because yeah. um, that sort of crisp line is, is uh, important. Yeah. Okay. So what I've done so far, and, and correct me if I've misunderstood, is under H, closing of the public hearing, the first paragraph is unchanged except the last sentence of the second paragraph, the commission may not proceed to deliberate, et cetera, is now the second to last sentence in the first paragraph of H. So it would say um, the chair shall ask the commission if there's any objection to closing the hearing. If there's no objection, the public comment portion will be closed. If a commission member objects, a vote will be taken on whether to continue the public hearing. A majority vote will be required to continue the hearing. The commission may not proceed to deliberate and vote on the issue until the public hearing is closed. Once the public hearing is closed on a quasi-judicial matter, no additional testimony may be taken and the commission will be limited to questions to staff only, deliberations and voting. The, and then the next paragraph, the remainder of the next paragraph is struck. Works. Commissioner, you're muted, um, Chair. Great. Nicely done. Um, thanks for that. Uh, any objections to the language that Lucy just, Commissioner Dillon? I would actually flip those last two sentences. Um, the um, the last sentence, the commission may not proceed to deliberate and vote on the issue until the public hearing is closed to me is the most final um, of that process. So I would just flip those two sentences, but no strong objection if others feel differently. Yeah, any objections to Commissioner Dillon's recommended edit to flip those last two? sentences. Um, I'm sorry, I think I'm, I missed that. Um, how would the ending paragraph read then? So I'm going to start the with ending the sentence. Paragraph. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think I think the, the rest of that second paragraph um, that was talking about the continuance would go away and be covered in L. So it would just be basically taking the last sentence of, of the first paragraph and the last sentence of the second paragraph 
putting them together in one order or the other. I don't know. If you need I me to read them, I will. I will read the last three sentences um, if that's Please. helpful to you. Yeah. Perfect. Please. Okay. So I'm going to start with a majority vote, um, in, rather than reading the whole paragraph. A majority vote will be required to continue the hearing. The commission may not proceed to deliberate and vote on the issue until the public hearing is closed. Once the public hearing is closed on a quasi-judicial matter, no additional testimony may be taken and the commission will be limited to questions to staff only, deliberations and voting. Or a majority vote will be required to continue the hearing. Once the public hearing is closed on a quasi-judicial matter, no additional testimony may be taken and the commission will be limited to questions to staff only, deliberations and voting. The commission may not proceed to deliberate and vote on the issue until the public hearing is closed. I think it works. Others uh, agree, disagree with that. Any objections to that? I'm fine with it either way. It, it, the, the, the language captures the way we need to operate. I mean, yeah. I think we're fine. I just need to know which order you want. Any objections to the last um, sequence that Lucy read as the final amendment? I prefer the last sequence she read. Okay, I hear no other. I hear no objections to that, so we'll use that uh, last sequence, Lucy. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anything else in section eleven? Yay. Okay. Section twelve. Oh, actually, we're moving on to um, Article five. Well, there is a section twelve, but I don't know that that. Article 5. Article 6, any questions or edits? And Article, well, I'm pretty sure we're okay with the last one. So I think that gets us Commissioner, uh-oh, Commissioner yeah. Sanford. Below the line. You, you didn't read below the line, oh. Chair. Uh, the link to the IMC at the end there actually goes to, to that's the that that's the IMC for the Planning Policy Commission, and uh, ours should be IMC eighteen oh three oh eighty one thirty. Nice catch. I did not go that far, <laughs> Commissioner Morgan. I I do have one question on Article eleven or no six amendments. Um, they may be amended by a majority vote of the full commission. Is there a definition of the full commission? Does that mean it has to be uh -oh. seven regular members or can it be four that's a quorum? Oh, I Lucy, Lucy, you're muted, muted. And I'm happy to answer that. That's just clarifying that um, it's not a majority of a quorum. So if you have four, four of you attending a meeting, which would be a legitimate meeting, and three of you voted in support, that's not sufficient. There needs to be four of you voting in support. It could be four of four, or it could be four of seven. It's just clarifying that four is the minimum threshold that can adopt revisions to the rules and regulations. So when it says a majority vote of the Full commission. Full commission means seven members. Seven. Correct. Should I'm just just curious? Could that be clarified to say by a vote, a positive vote of at least four members of the commission? It could. You or know, a quorum. The majority of well, I think it's four. Four is a majority of seven, so that's considered a, a, a yes. And Atisha, for the quasi-judicial proceedings too, if we only have four members present that day and they're making a decision on a project and three say yes and one say no, that means it's a no because it's not a majority of the seven. 
that has come up in some Robert's rules on a complicated hearing at one time. I'm not sure we run into a situation here where we only have four members attending, but it would be helpful to clarify. Yeah, Minnie, under, under Robert's rules, um, if there's four commissioners present and three are in support and one is opposed, that would still pass if a, a majority of the commission is the requirement. I know, um, I know with the city council, there are some provisions in state law that, that trigger this provision, a majority of the full membership. And so uh, it, it depends if there's not a provision in state law, then I would say three to one would be um, pass. Yeah, that we walked away from one hearing with that idea and the next day the city attorney said no, that meant it, it failed. And then we had to go back and kind of redo that thing. So I don't know whether which rules played out over there, but it's um, but again, it's a hypothetical situation. We may not run into a situation where we only have four members present because we have alternates. So. Commissioner Morgan, did you want to make a, a recommendation on an edit to article number? Um, um, I, I think it would help just to clarify it, to say that um, and somehow to say it means at least four yes votes. Because again, if it would it were if it was five people voting and it was three voted yes, that would fail for this amendment. Um, and so instead of just saying full commission, unless we define full commission. And I would suggest um using four or more members. Uh -huh. In lieu. That sounds good to me. Lucy, did you catch? Maybe amended by an affirmative vote of four or more members. There, that's that's yeah. that. I think that works. Good. Okay, um, Commissioner Sanford, are you good? <laughs> okay. Any uh, final call, uh, Commissioners? Any other questions or suggested edits? All right, seeing none. Good work. So, Lucy, I think we we need to move this to a vote uh, of the commission. Do we want to walk through the document very quickly so you can see the amendments before? Uh, is that possible? Yes. Can you share your screen, Lucy? Um, yeah. If, if you're ready. Okay. So, um, oops. So I just um, am dropping in a um, into the chat uh, for uh, commissioners uh, a motion, uh, just so that in case uh, you can consider that along with everything else I'm about to show you. Um, okay. You're doing a good job multitasking tonight, Lucy. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. All right, is this big enough? Can people see this? You might need to go a little bigger if possible. Okay. Or I can move it on to my big there. That that's good. Is that is that big enough? All right. Um, this is done in so you know if you don't see um, a line on the left or um, so here's our first um, edit uh, under Article Four One B. The staff liaison will cancel the regular meeting. Uh, under D, if a regular meeting falls on a legal holiday, the chair will set an alternate date in consultation with the staff liaison. Uh, under special meetings, special meetings of the commission may be called by the chair in consultation with the staff liaison. Uh, in F, we're removing first or 
in B, um, Section 5B, um, any member anticipating absence from a meeting should notify the designated staff liaison in advance of the meeting. Uh, inserting two uh, in section four of in seven, um, if any written materials are provided to the commission, a copy shall also be provided to the staff liaison or the recording secretary during the meeting or hearing. Um, under voting, if there's a conflict of interest, um, the commissioner will be considered ex ex that doesn't work. Um, You could do Lucy suggesting their absence will be considered excused. Right. Please remember that for the next situation that shows up because this occurs one other time. And okay. I like that I, I like that wording better. I think you have it excused in there twice. Mm -hmm. Uh, their absence will be considered. Ex oh, no, excuse me. You're good. Okay. Um, removed conflict of interest and from the title. Uh, if a member is excused, they shall leave the member of the chamber immediately. Um, they will. Yeah, this is. Their absence will be considered excused when voting occurs. Commission members should not read or reply to any correspondence from the applicant or the public on a quasi-judicial matter. Um, after commission members have completed their appearance of fairness disclosures, the chair shall invite the applicant and the members of the public to raise a challenge under the appearance of fairness doctrine. If a member is excused, they shall leave the chamber immediately. Um, so a majority vote will be required to continue the hearing. Once the public hearing is closed on a quasi-judicial matter, no additional testimony may be taken and the commission will be limited to questions to staff only deliberations and voting. The commission may not proceed to deliberate and vote on the issue until the public hearing is closed. Next paragraph is removed. The rules and regulations may be amended by an affirmative vote of four or more members of the commission. And then we'll correct the um, citation here. I believe it's 80 through 100. Um, anything that um, I should uh, go back to or that commissioners need to see again? I'm hearing, I'm hearing none. Can, can we, we go, can we go back to that. section two? Sure. It's too quick in the draw. Yeah. I'm noticing that we took out the ability of the majority of the commission to call a special meeting um, and, and assign that just to the chair. And I'm wondering if um, I, I would think in most circumstances that would be just fine, but I'm wondering if, if that's something that we would want to retain in there. So that uh, in in your your concern is for a special meeting that a, a hypothetical situation, say where the chair is is opposed to calling a meeting, and but the majority um, would would overrule that. I I don't think it's very likely. I'm just um, wondering if we want to protect that um, that avenue. So if you did, we could move the in consultation with the staff liaison to right after 
may be called by the chair in consultation with the staff liaison, liaison or by a majority vote of the commission members. That would, that, I think that would be fine too. I mean, the, the majority of the commission should be able to overrule the chair. Um, I would hope so. Yes. So uh, as far as that edit, um, any concern about adding that clarification? No. Okay. Is the building comfortable with that language? Anything, anyone, uh, before I draw too quickly and shut down the shared document, anything else anyone would like to revisit? Okay, Lucy, I think you're safe. Okay, uh, good work getting all the way through the document and excellent questions and edits. Uh, is there a motion for approval? Commissioner okay. Morgan. A question, I guess. Um, would Mr. Chair, Lucy, would I be voting in this case as an alternate? The longest standing alternate in place of a member that's not in attendance? Well, this isn't a quasi-judicial matter, um, and uh, it is pertaining to the entire commission. Uh, so, uh, Tisha, I don't know if you if you have more insight. So, uh, the the total vote count tonight can't exceed seven. So, I see there are eight members present, including two alternates. So, one of the alternates should vote as a regular member. And um, the the by the rules that are about to be adopted do provide some more specific um, tools to help determine which alternate. They're not in place right now, so um, maybe the chair can help determine which uh, alternate votes on this issue. So, well, 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 perhaps perhaps since after the vote, I would have to vote, but before John could vote, maybe we let him vote on it. Give him a chance to vote on something. Uh, you're funny. Actually, I, I did read the rules and the longest standing membership gets to vote. So, Well, those so, aren't adopted yet. Um, that is a new feature. So um, you, you, you could be the designated hitter tonight. <laughs> All right. Okay, Thanks, so make sure Akita will uh, take the chair um, for the vote then. Okay, so I need a motion. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make. Uh, I'd like to. I would like to make a motion to recommend adoption of the Development Commission Rules of Conduct and Procedures, as presented in tonight's agenda materials, with the following amendments. Um, exactly, how are we entering the amendments into the record? Well, um, I think you might. I might make a suggest a friendly amendment, and since we've just reviewed them in such detail, and that it might say as presented in tonight's agenda materials and with the amendments as shown. Okay, I'm going to restate the motion, uh, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to recommend adoption of the Development Commission Rules of Conduct and Procedures as presented in tonight's agenda materials, with the following amendments. Um, and of course, I forgot what you just said. <laughs> it's in the chat uh, if it's useful to you. Oh, I don't see it. Um, and with the amendments as shown. Great. Second. Is there, is there a second? I second. Okay. We have a, a motion and a second. Are there any, uh, is there any additional discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, and opposed, say nay. The motion carries by unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Um, let me go back to my list here. On what's next for tonight. Um, I think, do we have any council report, um, Lucy, for this evening? 
Um, I would actually defer to Director Dollywall. Um, she attends council more often than I do. I don't have any items uh, that I'm aware of. Yeah, no, no reports on that. I lost track of my notes, so I'll just have to wing it here. Are there any, is there any other business for the commission upcoming meetings um, that we should be aware of? Um, yes, um, thank you, uh, Chair Brennan. Um, there are several upcoming meetings. Um, we're hitting a busy season, um, as you may be aware. Uh, next week on October 28th, we're having a joint meeting with the uh, Planning Policy Commission, beginning uh, the first of three buckets related to Title 18 um, that the Development Commission has uh, been asked to work with um, uh, Planning Policy Commission on. Uh, there is a potential second meeting on November 4th. Uh, that meeting will only occur if there uh, is additional discussion from the October 28th meeting that needs, to, uh, needs additional time. Uh, we don't anticipate that at this time, but we, we don't know how robust the conversation may be. Uh, and then November 17th is currently scheduled as a um, community conference and neighborhood uh, meeting uh, and on a project that's forthcoming. Um, the uh, lead planner, Holly Keaton and myself would like to meet with the uh, chair and vice chair to, uh, we have some, uh, a, a revised approach uh, from how the FERS at Talis um, meeting was structured that we would like to meet with you and review uh, to make sure that makes sense, um, just in terms of order and structure. And uh, then I believe that's the end of the meetings for the year until January. Um, the only other item I, I wanted to add, unless there are questions about the meetings uh, from any of the commissioners, no additional questions. Uh, one, one quick um, before you move to the next thing is we did not, uh, I don't know if there's anybody on the call this evening, uh, Lucy, but for public comment, if there are members of the public that are present uh, this evening, want to give them an opportunity to speak. Um, thank you for confirming that. No, there are no other uh, attendees at the meeting. Okay, then back to you. Um, one thing that you will notice uh, going forward is that um, there will be um, a request when you get a packet to RSVP if you're not attending. And I just want to emphasize that because with the WebEx format, I actually cannot track your responses unless I um, get an email. So um, for instance, um, uh, I, I do send the placeholders, and you all are very good about responding to those, but things do happen and change. And so I um, would request that if you are not going to be able to attend, that you specifically send me an email um, uh, letting me know that so that to ensure, A, that you have an excused absence, and B, that we have a quorum. Um, because, for instance, this evening, and this is in no way um, a criticism of any commissioners, this was an error on my part. I actually didn't know if we were going to have a quorum this evening. Um, so uh, we, we will um, add a note to the emails that go out um, to uh, be a tickler to ask you to let us know. Great. Thank you for that. Any other questions um, or comments for this evening? Hearing none, I believe our business is concluded. So we will adjourn the meeting at 9.10. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.